We've read Matthew 27, and uh, hasn't it been good to be in church this morning? And good to see some missions update, and good to uh, hear from Paul going to India. And let's get behind and pray for Paul and as he prepares for going to India. It sounds like a daunting task to me. <laughs> so uh, let's pray about that. Um, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We pray for our pastor. He's not here, and he'll be back tonight. And I just want to mention one person before I go, and, and please don't think that you're excluded, but I just want to say it's a blessing to have Cherry here this morning. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, Cherry was attacked by a dog a few weeks ago and uh, nearly tore her eyes out, and uh, she could have died very easily. And here she is, and hardly any scars there now. So I just want to thank the Lord for that publicly, Cherry. It's a blessing to see you here. And uh, she just says thank you for the prayers of the church and individuals. And as I wear this tie, you all know that I honour uh, Trish in wearing this tie, Trish Lloyd. And I uh, just want to pray now and uh, think of those that are sick. Um, in your mind, I, I might pray for one or two. I just think of Gilbert at home and, uh, and, and Margaret. And they're probably listening this morning, so hello Gilbert, Margaret, and also Heather and Lou. And I think of, um, uh, oh dear, dear, I can't think of his name now, but in the hospital as well, you know who I mean, Ted Burke. And uh, you might think of others, okay, that are sick and sorrowing, and you might be sick yourself this morning. And just pray for each other as we pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for being in church this morning. Thank you for the missions updates we've had. And again, I just want to say thank you to Cherry's here with us this morning and you spared her life from the attack of, uh, of the dog. And Lord, we, uh, we just give you thanks that her face is healed up and hardly showing any effects. But Lord, we realize that's your process of healing that you've brought about. Father, we think of those that are not able to be with us. Think of Gilbert, Margaret, commit them to you, and Heather this morning, Ted Burke, we lift them up to you. We ask that you would comfort and encourage them, strengthen them, each one. Others of us that are sick, we think of Debbie this morning. And Lord, we, uh, as each one of us in our minds, think of somebody that we know is under a a burden, we just ask that you comfort them this morning, give them your grace. Guide us now as we look at your word, we think of our missionaries also and thank you for them. Lord, thank you for the Kaufmans and we'll hear from them tonight. Thank you for this trip that Paul's planning to India. Thank you for Pastor Jeevan and we just want to commit the brethren to you there in India and pray for the preparation and the funds that Paul is seeking to raise to help help pastors in India just get around on a bike. Lord, we thank you for that. We just commit them to you. Guide us now as we look in your word, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this morning I want to look at a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, as we've already looked and, and read this morning. This man is mentioned in the whole four of the Gospels. And uh, he's mentioned as the man who comes and begs Pilate for the body of Jesus. And he buries Jesus, well, he lays Jesus' body in his own tomb that he had hewn out of the rock. But I want to think of uh, Nicodemus this morning, not Nicodemus, Joseph, sorry, as somebody who worked out a puzzle before it happened. How many of us have received a, a puzzle? Perhaps like this, you know, oftentimes at Christmas time, don't we? We get a puzzle or we get a, uh, you know, a trinket like this and, and the aim is to get it apart. And you spend ages at it, you know, just fiddling with the jolly thing and, and, uh, and messing around and and uh, I don't think I got this one back together right because I can get it apart pretty easy now. And I know when I first got it, I couldn't get it apart. 
and you'd play around with it and you'd push it this way and that and, and you always end up just in a bind, you know, in a corner. And, and it's not until your thinking changes and you start sort of fiddling with it a different way, oh, bang, got it. Just like that. You know. I've never managed to get a Rubik's Cube right. <laughs> and I've fiddled with them for a long time. But you know something? I reckon Joseph of Arimathea, he puzzled over some things for a long time. The scriptures tell us that Joseph was a, uh, he was one of the counsellors. Now it doesn't say that here in our, uh, in our text, but I want you to come with me to, to Luke, uh, Luke chapter 23. I'm not going to go to every one of the Gospels, but we'll go to Luke. We'll, we'll miss Mark. We'll go to Luke chapter 23 and we'll see uh, an aspect about him here that we don't see back there in Matthew. Some of the things are repeated, but some of them are not. And, and Luke mentions something that uh, the others don't say. Luke chapter 23 in verse 50, And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counsellor, and he was a good man, and adjust. The fact that he was a counsellor means he was one of the 70 ruling elders in Jerusalem. You know, they, there was always sort of a, a, spe, a number of 70 that were the ruling elders at, at a time in Jerusalem. And so the fact that it says that Joseph was a counsellor, he was one of the, uh, one of the, the um, Sanhedrin, it's called, the 70. And uh, it's, but it also says that he was a good man and a just. And then it says, the same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He didn't consent, con, consent with them to put Jesus to death. Now, he was the only one, apart from one other. Okay. There was two in actual fact, that didn't consent to Jesus being put to death. Come with me now to, to John, John chapter 19. John chapter 19. John chapter 19 and verse 38. And we see another man comes into the picture here. Verse 38, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly. So we know then from, from uh, Matthew and from Luke that uh, Joseph was a, uh, uh, a counsellor, a just, a good man, etc. But he, he was here, it says he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly. He hadn't made it known, you know, in the three years leading up to Jesus' death. He'd remained a counsellor. But somewhere in that time, he became one of Jesus' disciples. Somewhere in that three years, he acknowledged Jesus as Lord. But he kept it to himself and uh, didn't make it known for a period. But it says he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. So somewhere in the three years, Joseph came to a realisation that Jesus was Lord. But before that, I believe it was a puzzle to him. A bit like it was to the next man. It says, you know, he took the body of Jesus in the end of verse 38 and there came also Nicodemus. Nicodemus was also one of the 70. Nicodemus at the first, came to Jesus by night. When was that? Well, back in John chapter 3, it's recorded that, G that Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said, oh, we know that you're a, you know, a teacher sent from God, for you, you couldn't do these things except God was with him. And Jesus never sort of replied to him, oh, you, you know, you're going to see greater than this. You, know, you haven't seen anything yet. He immediately just says to to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Well, was that a puzzle to Nicodemus? Oh, you bet it was. He said, how can these things be? How can I unravel that? You know, it was like this puzzle. 
And he, he, he said, how can I unravel that? You know, how, that's impossible. How can a man be born again? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? That's impossible. That's, you can't unravel that. Jesus said, I tell you, except you be born of water, you be born first, physically, then you must be born spiritually. Otherwise, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. He sent Nicodemus away. Nicodemus, I don't think, got saved that night. But he went away with a puzzle ringing in his head. Just, how can these things be? Jesus even had had the audacity, as it were, to say to him, are you a master in Israel? And you don't know these things? Well, did that set the cat among Nicodemus' pigeons? You bet it did. He was puzzled. But you know, Nicodemus also didn't consent to the deed. Come back with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. We have Joseph of Arimathea puzzling over the things about Jesus. Somewhere in these three years he didn't, he, or he, he trusted Jesus as his saviour, but he kept it to himself secretly. Nicodemus, back there in John chapter 3, and we won't go there yet, we might get there in a minute, but uh, Nicodemus was said a puzzle. We come to John chapter 7, and the whole chapter is sort of a, a, a dialogue. It's, a, it's a talking about the Jews. In fact, verse 1, it says, After these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. And when it says there, the Jews, it's particularly saying the 70. The 70, the Sanhedrin, they were the rulers of the Jews. So they were the spokesmen, the spokespeople for the nation at that time. Although they were under Roman rule, but for the Jews, they were the leaders. So the Jews sought to kill him. And the whole of chapter 7 is sort of, uh, often sort of comes to the point of they're seeking to kill him. Look in verse 25, Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek, they, you know, speaking of the 70, seek to kill? Seek to kill. But lo, he speaks boldly. So the, 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 the crowd is confused. Some think that he is the Christ, it says there. Some think, oh no, he's a madman. Uh, some think that he's, that he's uh, you know, fueled along by the devil himself but they seek to kill him. They seek to kill him. And uh, look at what it says in verse 33 no not verse 33 32 the, the, the officers come back to the, the uh, no they sent sorry the chief priests and the officers sent or sent officers to take him at the end of verse 32. You drop down to verse 45, then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, so they'd sent him, sent them to get Jesus, bring him back because they wanted to kill him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees and they said unto them, why have ye not brought him? Then answered them the Pharisees, or the officers answered, sorry, in verse 46, never man spake like this man. Wow, I reckon they had a puzzle, didn't they? They were puzzled, sort of, and when they went and heard Jesus, thought, we can't take him, you know. We can't arrest him. He's a, he's a good man, you know. And nobody speaks like him. And, uh, but then look what the, the Pharisees answered. Then answered them the Pharisees, are you also deceived? Like, we're not conned by him like you, bunch of dummies. Come back without him. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Have any of us believed on him? Seventy? There's seventy of us. None of us believe on him. They didn't realise. Well, the spokesman, whoever the spokesman was, probably Caiaphas, didn't realise that Joseph believed on him. Didn't realise that actually Nicodemus had come to the point of believing on him. (coughs) Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? No, nobody. Well, actually, two had. And verse 49, But this people 
who knoweth not the law, are cursed. Wow, the venom that came out of their mouths. Well, Nicodemus, look at verse 50. Nicodemus sort of comes to the fore. And he says to them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, he was one of the seventy, and yet he's now one of the two that didn't consent to the deed of wanting to kill him. He makes, he just questions, he says, Doth our Lord judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? You know, don't we, shouldn't we give him a fair trial and know what he doeth? Well, they answered and said unto him, Huh, are you also of Galilee? Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. You see, they knew the scriptures. Micah said that he was of Bethlehem, come of Bethlehem. Well, they hadn't sort of gone back 30 years, had they, and realised Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Oh, that was all just erased from their memory. All the events of 30 years ago when Herod went and he killed all the babies, two years old and under. Erased from their memory. Who was that? What was that all about? He didn't know, didn't care. Oh, brethren, when we don't remember history, we go forward at our own peril. And they went forward at their own peril. Are you also of Galilee? Search and look. Out of Galilee arises no prophet. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Someone had already said that before. And every man went into his own house. So here we have Joseph of Arimathea. We have Nicodemus, two men in a firestorm. They had 68 other counsellors that were so set on killing Jesus. But these two men, two men out of 70, two men dared to walk against the time. Two men against 70? You can't stop a tide like that, can you? They knew that they couldn't persuade these other 68. They were frightened themselves. They were sort of, you know, I reckon he's Christ, I reckon he's God, but they are insane with them because they knew as soon as they did they'd be cast out of the 70 and no longer have access to the synagogue They'd made that very clear to others. So they're in a puzzle. They're in a quandary. What do we do? You know, I reckon that these two men, they would have noticed. Joseph would have noticed the day that Nicodemus sort of stood up and said, you know, doesn't our law, you know, shouldn't we give him a fair trial? I reckon after that, Joseph of Arimathea went up to Joseph and he said, Joseph, Sorry, Joseph of Arimathea went up to Nicodemus and said, Nicodemus, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Nicodemus perhaps sort of thought, well, uh, what are you thinking? He said, well, I'm beginning to think that he's the Messiah. Well, you know what, Joseph? The night I went to talk to him, He said some troubling things to me. He said to me, he said that I had to be born again. Well, I've been puzzling over that for weeks. I've been struggling with that. I just, what's he mean? And then he said, he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I'll draw all men unto myself. He said that. What does that mean? Well, let's think about it. Moses in the wilderness, when the people were being bitten by the serpents, God sent serpents amongst the people because they were murmuring and just complaining and and just not, you know, submitting to the the law as as God had given it to us. And so God sent all these serpents and, and, and they started fiery serpents. They were biting the people. And uh, 
Moses besought the Lord and said, Lord, what do we do? And, and, and God said, well, get a, get, a, get a bit of brass, shape it into a serpent and stick it on a pole. Stick it on a pole where everybody in the camp can see it. Now, you've got to remember, this is a big camp, you know, over a couple of million people spread over it. That's Brisbane. How did he find a place to stick this thing on a pole where everybody could see it? I don't know. And maybe they actually couldn't all physically see it, but they knew where it was. So somewhere in the middle of Brisbane was set up this thing on a pole and they knew where it was. And if they were bitten at Albany Creek by a serpent, they just had to look towards Brisbane and they knew where that serpent was on a pole and God would heal them of that bite. And he did. Well, what do you... You mean he said that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so he has to be lifted up? That doesn't sound good, Joseph. No. Hey, hey you know what? I've been, I've been going through the scrolls of Isaiah and... And I've found a place where it says some puzzling things and so I want you to come with me to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Now, when Joseph and Nicodemus went and looked for Isaiah 53, they just didn't, they didn't have chapters and verses like we've got. They just had a roll. They had a scroll and they had to scroll through it. But Joseph perhaps said to Nicodemus or Nicodemus said to Joseph, you know, come with me into Isaiah. And they unrolled the scroll and they found the place where it was written in Isaiah 53. And they started to read through this together and, and, uh, and Nicodemus perhaps pointed out to, to, to Joseph, he said, look, you see what it says here? In verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken. Boy, that sounds like the 68, doesn't it? That sounds like us, 70 minus you and me. 68, esteem him stricken. We, we want to kill him. But smitten of God and afflicted. Sure, it's a puzzle. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Ooh. All we like sheep have gone astray. Oh, Nicodemus. Perhaps says Joseph. Nicodemus, I know I've gone astray. Really, I know I have. We've turned everyone to his own way. Then it says, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Oh, it's starting to sort of... It may be, Nicodemus, that he has to die for us. You know, I heard... I wasn't there, but I heard one of the disciples say that, you know, the day that Jesus went out into the wilderness where John the Baptist was, and there's speaks about a fella being the forerunner, you know, before the Christ, and, and uh, somebody said that when John the Baptist saw Jesus come, that he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Lamb of God. Well, we like sheep have gone astray. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. As a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Phew. Maybe, maybe he has to die. He's got to be put up like a serpent. That means on a pole. That means up in the air. 
He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off. Cut off. That looks like dying to me. Cut off. Out of the land of the living. That means, yeah, got rid of. Out of the land of the living. For the, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Joseph, or maybe Joseph said to Nicodemus, Snake and Mike, hair crawl. But you know, we've been we've been offering lambs in the temple every morning and every night since it was built. And then it stopped for a while. We were in captivity, but since we've had the temple built again, we've been offering a lamb every morning and every night. But you know, that doesn't get rid of my sins. right. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. He's taken from prison. Who should have taken? He was cut off for the transgression. Nicodemus, we need a saviour. We don't just need a lamb. We need a saviour. And it might be that he has to be And he made his grave. Grave grave means dead, doesn't it? Pretty plain, isn't it, Joseph? Grave means dead. You die, you go in the grave. You don't come out. He made his He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he'd done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. You know, I reckon something tumbled in Joseph's mind at this time. With the wicked and with the rich in his death. The rich. Now, Joseph was rich, wasn't he? It says that in Matthew. Joseph found that he was a rich man. We believe from history that Joseph was probably minister of mines in the Roman government at the time, or he had access to the Roman government. He was appointed by them as minister of mines. It's believed that he travelled through the Roman Empire and particularly to uh, Britain, or Tarshish as it was called then. And and, uh, somehow in his dealings, in his business, he'd become rich. Simple. He was a rich man. And uh, anyway, I want to submit to you this morning that I reckon in Joseph's cogitations in trying to work out the puzzle, he came to a point. Either he had got a plot on Calvary's Hill prior to this and he cut out a tomb there in the rock. It says that. Scriptures tell us that quite clearly. He had a tomb cut out in the rock on Calvary's Hill. Either he had done it before he read this and before he sort of come to realised that Jesus had to die. Either he had done it, he'd got the tomb cut out because he wanted a burial place in Jerusalem, but I can't, personally, I don't think that fits. You know, He was of Arimathea. Arimathea was a town out in Judea. Why would he want a burial place in Jerusalem? I don't know. Generally, they were buried in their burial place at home, weren't they? You know, he would have had a family burial place at home. And that's where he would have wanted to be buried, next to his father's. That was sort of the tradition. Maybe, though, he had prior to decided, hey, I want a burial place in Jerusalem. But it doesn't really wash with me. I could be wrong. That's just my theory. I reckon he read that and he said, he's going to be strung up, if he's got to be lifted up like a serpent, you know what we do here? We lift him up on crosses, don't we? Well, the Romans do it for us. I reckon if they get their way, the 68, that's what's going to happen to him. Where do we have them crucified? Out on Calvary's Hill, out on Golgotha, out, you know, the 
outside the city. They had a place in a rocky area where they had holes in the ground. They had to carry their cross, remember, the criminals. Jesus carried his own cross until he couldn't bear it anymore and then Simon of Cyrene picked it up and carried it for him. They laid that cross down on the ground and they nailed criminals to it. That's what they did with Jesus. Then they lifted that cross up and they dropped it into the hole in the ground. They had a place out there on the hill ready for it. That's what they did from week to week whenever they had crucifixion, whenever they wanted to do that. Joseph said to Nicodemus, you know what? I'm going to have a tomb up there. I reckon he bought the block. I reckon he bought the plot because it says in John that it was nearby. It was nearby to the uh, place where he was crucified. Why would you want your family family burial block next to a place of crucifixion? You wouldn't want it, would you? Joseph never did get buried there. His family never did get buried there. I personally think it is just my opinion. I personally think he bought that block. Perhaps a year before the crucifixion took place. Perhaps only six months before. It was a brand new tomb. He had it hewn out of the rock. He had it ready. He said to Nicodemus, he said, if he's going to be crucified, I'm going to be ready to bury him. Because they'd heard him say, didn't they say in Matthew? The Pharisees or the, 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 the 70 came, the 68, 70 minus 2, came to uh, Pilate after the crucifixion in, in uh, Matthew and said, we remember that that deceiver said, after three days I'll rise again. Well, they'd watched the fact that he was buried in the tomb by Nicodemus or Joseph and Nicodemus. So they said, can you let us set a seal and set a watch so that he can't get out? Pilate said, yeah, go away, go ahead. They had the Roman watch. They put a seal on it. Ha, we've got him. They had seen the fact that Joseph had him embalmed and wrapped up in 40 kilos or a talent, I think it says there, of, of spices. So, you know, you don't come out of 40 or 50 uh, kilos of spices wrapped over your body and then wrapped up with linen cloths. You don't get out of that, do you? Nobody gets out of that unless they're taken out or unless they're gone, unless they're risen, from, unless they can rise themselves from. We remember. That deceiver said, after three days I'll rise again. Well, set a watch, set a seal. Can't happen, can it? He won't get out. But Joseph knew if he's God and he's already done all these miracles, he said he's got to die for us. That's what the scriptures tell us. You know what? I found another spot. Uh, Joseph, come with me to... Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Psalm 16. And about verse... Oh, I've got to find it. Psalm 16. And perhaps Joseph and, and uh, Nicodemus flicked back through other references that you and I haven't gone to this morning, but uh, have a look here. Psalm of David... David wrote this, but he wasn't speaking about himself because he's been buried for hundreds of years at this point. So they're puzzling about it. Look in verse 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Nicodemus, I'm going to buy that plot. I'm going to have a sepulchre ready or a tomb ready. He's there when he's crucified. That's what's going to happen. We're going to be ready for it. They were. Brethren, I just want to submit to you this morning as we close. They worked out the puzzle. They worked it out beforehand. The disciples didn't until after. Most people didn't. 
Perhaps the only other one that did was Mary of Bethany. Because remember he said when she she poured all that ointment on him, she's done this for the day of my burial. Burial. He spoke plainly about it. Nicodemus and Joseph worked it out. Brethren, this morning, that's what missions is all about, isn't it? As we've you know, get into missions today and thinking about our missionaries, that's what it's all about. It's working out the puzzle of life. We're all sinners. We all need to be saved. Jesus is the Savior. Have you worked that puzzle out? Have you worked it out? I bless God that uh, He showed me about 43 years ago, and I was saved. Born again. You worked out the puzzle. I leave it with you and trust that if you haven't yet, you will. They worked it out with only half the Bible. We have the whole, we have it all laid out to us. We have the whole dialogue. We can figure it out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for. Joseph of Arimathea, we want to thank you for Nicodemus and we want to thank you that they worked out the puzzle. They were saved. Two men against a tide of 68, against a tide of humanity at the time that wanted Jesus crucified. Oh Lord, if the whole multitude had to realise that says in Corinthians they would not have crucified the Lord They tried to fix up their first mistake by then setting a watch because they even acknowledged that the second mistake could be worse than the first. Oh Lord, if only they'd realised now that that indeed was the case. Jesus is the Christ. He rose from the dead. He's alive forevermore, seated at your right hand. Oh Father, we thank you for that. Just pray that you'd Work in our hearts. Encourage us. Lord, if there be anybody here today that is not saved, that they'd work out the puzzle and be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.